Hey there, friends and foes. Welcome to Back of the Cereal Box, our Wednesday night live show. New comics. Yum! And normally, it's just yours truly, Johnny, flying solo. But tonight, 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 we've got the entire Back of the Cereal Box family and some special guests and uh, maybe some more people joining us a little bit later. But uh, let's bring them on one at a time. Your favorite pinup cosplayer, DL Memphis. How you doing, Hello. DL? I am doing wonderful. How are you doing? I am doing great. And tonight we have dueling Agathas because joining us. We are not us... dueling. <laughs> Complimenting. They're they're yes. twinsies. Uh, is uh, Phoenix Sisters cosplay and the host of Back Issue Breakfast Club, Miss Kelly Getner. How you doing, Kelly? Hey, I'm doing good. <laughs> And uh, loving the purple eyeshadow. Why, thank you. My it's husband told great. me to go wild with the hair and the makeup, so. <laughs> we approve, we approve. And rocking out a great, great Black Widow cosplay, the one, the only, the mythical, legendary Willow Skyler. There she is. Ooh, nice mug. How you doing, I have Willow? That mug. I, I have that mug. I need that mug. It, it, it's great to go to the Disney store and just raid their cups. <laughs> That's fantastic. And uh, in a little bit, we will be joined by Brian and Nicole. But right now, it's just two empty chairs. And uh, somewhere, somewhere along the line, uh, Aubrey X is going to be joining us, and Lucas Leverett will be joining us. Uh, we hope. Uh, who is that? Speak. Say the devil's name, and he appears. Mephisto? Um, yes. yes. If, I can, if I can get him on camera. <laughs> there he is. Hello. The, the crazy liberal himself, Lucas Leverett. <laughs> Hello, Lucas. Hi. Happy What's birthday, up? Lucas. Thanks. Oh, happy birthday. Oh, happy It was birthday. yesterday. Oh. Oh, and well, have a belated birthday. And look who else just showed up from Reels and Heels, Brian and Nicole. How you guys Hello. doing? Uh oh. Not like we I don't see no enough of each other. <laughs> they're, they're they're muted. Ah, there we yeah. go, Brian and Nicole. How you guys doing? We're good, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I had muted you when uh, Nicole was off camera yelling at the kids. <laughs> Not wrong. <laughs> so, so we are here, guys, and hopefully Aubrey will be uh, joining us in a moment. But we are here to uh, talk about WandaVision. We got together mid-season. I think it was was it after s episode five, Brian, that we uh, all got together and talked about where we were in the series. And then afterwards, we had such a good time. We said, you know what? We need to do this after the series finale and everyone said yes we do so here we are now yeah. before we be before we get started this is our new comics day episode uh new comics yum and i just want to show real quick uh, a couple of new releases and uh, then we'll get rocking and rolling so up first strange academy number nine with a cover by frank cho and uh, if you guys know anything about Frank Cho, um, he's awesome. Out, he is an awesome artist. But you know what? It turns out he's he's a little bit of a naughty little elf. Um, <laughs> he uh, he don't care. Um, this is a, a great series by uh, Scotty Young and Humberto Ramos. Humberto Ramos is doing his best artwork uh, of his career, I believe, um, and it's all about. The next generation of magic users at uh, Doctor Strange's school and features one of my all-time favorite characters, Brother Voodoo, or Doctor Voodoo. But look at this Scarlet Witch outfit. Nice. Yeah. Someone, someone needs to I love that. Absolutely. Yes. Someone needs to cosplay that stat. Yeah. Kelly? Um, 
I'm pointing at you, Kelly. <laughs> that that would be a great one for you, Kelly. <laughs> Come on, John. I think you can rock that outfit, though. <laughs> I would pay you. You know. Money. You know. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> if let's let's see if we get to five thousand Facebook followers. I, I will do that costume with, D, <laughs> with DL Memphis's help. Yes. I will be glad to help. Let's this start like planning weird, this. This is about to be a weird Mrs. Doubtfire Marvel project. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lucas, you've oh, done yeah. I've been threatening to do my crossplay Harley Quinn for years. Mm. I've, I've got the entire costume ready to go. Hot pants and all. But yes. but I I'm not going to do it until we hit 5,000 followers on our Facebook page. I was going to say, um, why have we not seen this? Well, now there there now there are two. You, you just made a double commitment. You just promised yes, you two did. different cross dressing costumes. I guess I'm not supposed to say cross dressing anymore. I'll get canceled. But you gender get bending, <laughs> um, gender bending, yeah, gender well, bending. I call whichever, it cross play. Whichever but, new word that means cross play is a word. An old word, um, but. Uh, I would, I would, I would pay to see that. The, the more banana hammocky, the the better. <laughs> Can we? Okay, All wait right. a minute, wait a minute. Can we say five thousand for the Scarlet Witch, and then maybe a thousand for the Harley Quinn, since that's already sitting in your closet? <laughs> no, we're all, we're already at a thousand followers. Twenty five hundred. We're almost right there. I'll tell you what. See, right three, there. Three thousand. Three thousand. 3,000. Yes. This is negotiations this is a, right here. And it's step, finest. <laughs> all right. Up, process. up next, Blade Runner Origins, issue number one from Titan Comics. It is a prequel for the uh, Blade Runner film. And um, don't know a whole lot about it yet, but I picked it up because I love the whole cyberpunk uh, aesthetic. Written by Kay Perkins, uh, art by Fernando. Oh, actually, there are three writers. Kay Perkins, Mello Brown. What a great name. Mike Johnson, and art by Fernando uh, Dagnino. Um, not super wild about the art. I'm going to be honest with you. It's um, a little bit uh, a little bit too loose for my tastes, but um, I'm going to read it. This is a beautiful spread, though. That That's a beautiful oh, one. Wow. So that's on my reading list this week. And then you guys will be interested in this. Children of the Atom. Have you guys heard anything about this? Well, that story has been going on for a while. No, this is issue number one. Well, the the Atom, like the whole X Men, because they they did the the story a few years ago. Well, yes, they did, but this is a completely different story, Brian. These are um, kids of the X Men. Oh, I'm going to spoil it. They're, these are kids of the X Men from another reality oh, from okay. from the multiverse and um at least that's what i picked up so far i haven't read the whole thing yet i'm gonna read it tonight uh but uh you know it, it takes something really unique for me to pick up an x-men book and uh this is out so many <laughs> well yeah and you know th this is one of those instances where uh, I think it's really hard or really easy not to mess up the x-men and in this issue, they're doing the X-Men right. The right team members are there. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, they're staying true to the core. And uh, this, this is going to be a character we're going to see a lot of cosplay of. The daughter of Storm and Gambit. Oh, yes. Weird. Okay. That's an interesting mix. Yeah, yeah. But uh, written by Vita Aiella. Ayella and uh, art by Bernard Chang. So Children of the Atom, issue number one. And then finally, this is going to shock a lot of people. I've been really trying not to be just a Marvel shill. Ke Kelly, you're a DC girl. I've been a Marvel guy all my life. So today, in an effort, in a hopeful tone, because I've checked out a few of the future state titles, and they're not – very good. Yeah. But I did pick up Infinite Frontier issue oh. zero today. Interesting. Um, and this apparently is sets the stage for Future State. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know why they're releasing it after the Future State books have been out, but um, I, it looks good. It looks fun, but looks can be deceiving. <laughs> Uh, it, I guess it's a collection of short stories cobbled together into one because you got Justice League by Brian Michael Bendis, Superman by Philip Kennedy. There's a bunch of uh, creators on here, but it creates a um, a complete story. Good. And, and yeah, I hope, I hope <laughs> that there's a cool version of Titan's Tower. Nice. Uh, cool. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's what I'm reading this week. Uh, you guys uh, got anything specific you're reading this week? I am going to be reviewing it. I'm reading Neil Gaiman's um, The Books of Magic. So an Ooh. older one, but it's part of the Sandman universe. And um, it's a book that like the, the Sandman series gets talked about a lot, but The Books of Magic, not so much. And it's about Tim Hunter, who is an up-and-coming magician he basically he kind of looks like harry potter but he's not harry potter because it's no gaiman and he's taken in by john constantine and a few others to try to mentor him and teach him magic and show him the way so he doesn't become a danger to himself and the world and it's pretty is, interesting. That, is that your next episode of back issue breakfast club yes so that'll be next Tuesday. Everybody tune in and see Kelly's review of Sandman Books of Magic. Now, before we before we move on to our main topic, I got to show you guys one more thing. I can't believe I found this in the wild. Ooh. This Ooh. is the new Marvel Legends nice. retro line. Um, as if, you know, pretending if, if Kenner had made this line in the 70s. Um, Beautiful figure. These are not articulated, uh, which I actually like. Um, they're they're very much like the original uh, Star Wars figures in, in terms of articulation. But the packaging, look at that. That Bob Layton artwork, the bright colors. You got a, uh, a, a trading card on the back. It's just, uh, this is the only one I've seen in the wild. Uh, there's also Black Panther, um, Captain Marvel, Captain America. Uh, Spider-Man, Electro, and another one I can't remember. Where did you find uh, it? Target. It was the only one left. Listen, there were nine pegs for these figures. Wow. And and I heard they got stocked yesterday, and this was the only one left. Yeah, my Facebook friends have been saying that's where they find them is at Target. And – uh the a friend of mine picked up Captain America. There's a Captain America one. Yeah, I, I want it bad. Obviously, I'm a Captain America fan. So <laughs> all right. Well, on, on Saturday, when we went to do our breaks, uh, we went to Ollie's, and Ollie's is a great place to have to get graphic novels um and cheap. So yes, like it I, is. I found this, which takes place before the 2014 movie. Yes. And uh, it's actually, I like the artwork, and uh, it goes into a little bit more detail on uh, the the bombing of uh, Japan and, and how these creatures came to be. And you know uh, I'm a huge Godzilla fan, so I had to pick it up. You know Can what's you funny show about that, that one? Yeah, hold on, hold on. Let me bring him featured up. It is called Godzilla Awakening. Nice. Mm, okay, all right. Oh, it's, actually, Godzilla it's actually by Legendary. That's who put it out. And and Ollie's has it for two ninety nine. Yeah, yeah. Be because I picked it up myself for the uh, plane flight that I'm taking tomorrow night. So that's that's funny. And, Nicole, uh, Nicole, you got something? Yeah, I'm kind of like the weirdo of the group, I guess. But no. it's um. So I'm never I'm never going to read the actual book. Like I'm just not. <laughs> like I've tried. I've tried four times. I can't read it. Isn't the I actual book like that? Like like that big? It's like 800. Yes. It's like 800 pages, and I just I can't get into it. Like I can read the first chapter, and then I put it down because I just don't. I just can't. Like I don't know why. I love the show. I love the show on CBS, and I enjoyed the miniseries and 
you know, what, whatever it is, but I know I'm just never going to, I'm never going to read the book. So he found the graphic novel for me. So I'm going to read the graphic novel. Hey, excellent. 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 All right. So before we get into WandaVision, anybody else have anything uh, they want to share as far as new titles, things they're reading this week? I'm actually starting to read something important that figures into some of the folks that are gathered here. I got my uh, hardcover copy that I ordered to replace my long lost soft cover copy of Batman Digital Justice, which I'm brushing up on so that I can go do drunk comics <laughs> and do a read or retelling of that oh so late 90s computer generated comic book. And if you've never seen it, it is absolutely wretchedly perfect and awful and great all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go through a couple of comics before we uh, get started here. Uh, Dave Mattingly uh, is watching. He says, woohoo, and Woo it's been DL all along. You know, <laughs> speaking, <laughs> speaking of which. It's been Kelly all along, too. Come on. Cheers yes. to that. <laughs> Let's I'm see if empty. I can do this. Where's my command boy? Okay, who uh, called it the, the last episode that we did? So. Well, I, th I think... <laughs> I think all of us pretty much thought that Agnes was Agatha Harkness. Yes, we all agreed. Um, yeah. Um, and and spoiler alert, uh, I should have put that up there uh, to begin with. <laughs> so late. Spoiler alert, <laughs> Agnes was Agatha Harkness, which we predicted. And sadly, I think that's the only prediction we got right. Um, so we're going to talk about that. We got. Well, you, you know what's funny is that song went number one on iTunes. And did you know that's actually Catherine Hahn singing that song? I thought it probably was. Yeah. Sounds but like her. Je Jeremiah Patton says, ahoy. Clyde Hall says, hello, everyone. Kelly, you're fabulous. Kelly plus one division <laughs> equals double the fab. <laughs> Dave Mattingly <laughs> says, nice brooch, Kelly. Thank you. Scott Hitchcock says, there's just one theory. I was sad that didn't come true. Uh, two in all of the commercials, sadly, did not turn out to be Wanda's parents. Okay, we'll talk about that uh -huh. in a minute. Um, let's see. Dave Mattingly says, you think John isn't already rocking that look? Talking about the Scarlet Witch. <laughs> That or Harley Quinn. You said you have that. I do. Oh, yeah. I do. I do. And uh, Dave says, uh, have a safe trip. Watch out for Rodan. That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is kind of free form. I don't have an outline. I don't have any uh, specific plan. We're just kind of uh, going to have a stream of consciousness conversation. But uh, when we last met, we had all of these predictions about what we thought was going to happen. Uh, we did all predict that uh, Agnes was going to be Agatha Harkness. And um, that's pretty much the only prediction that actually came true. <laughs> yes. I, I still think some of those theories will come true in later, later films. Listen, listen, I've got a bone to pick with your guy, Mikey Sutton. Uh-oh. Nothing he predicted happened. He struck out big time. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just happy to not be predicting anything. I have I've had so much fun watching all the various uh, <laughs> opinions and ideas and just going with the flow and enjoying it. Um, that article, uh, Johnny, that you shared with a bunch of folks, where it's a uh, it's a brilliant satirical takedown mocking the entitled fandom that always wants their thing to be what gets into the script. Uh, that's something you, you probably should turn more people onto that if they haven't already seen it. But uh, I well, forgot. You know, it's I, a collider, I, isn't it? it or, yeah, it was a collider. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I posted that to some groups just saying, hey, take a look at this article. It's pretty fun. A, a great perspective. And so many people, like so many groups deleted it saying that it was too political. What? <laughs> wow. Is I, this really where we are? I think too political is the yes. new code word for, oh my goodness, it might spark controversial discussions about an academic topic, and we just can't have that. I don't know what these fools are going to do when they get into colleges. Yeah. <laughs> they they just won't college. go, that's all. Well, well, one of the theories that we shared, and uh, I think Brian and I sh felt shared this theory. We we 
thought that this was uh, going to happen, we were almost positive that the astrophysicist that um, Monica mentioned was going to be Reed Richards. That was our first. That was our first theory, right? And as we talked about it in the when we were last together, there were some clues that it might be Hank McCoy, the Beast. I mean, they were dropping Easter eggs hard all throughout the last, you know, th those issues, those uh, episodes, and 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 since. Yeah. the The other option was Adam Brashear, the the Blue Marvel. Yeah. Did Lucas, did Would we you say Lucas at all? Did that? Did, did any astrophysicist occur? No, I don't, no, no. Okay, so it's still a loose just end. A sled. <laughs> still a and, loose and, end then. And we 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 all thought because if we were writing this, we would have had Michael Fassbender's Magneto show up yes. in the season finale in some form or fashion, right? Yes. Yes. Sorry. Did it happen? Not, was that thirsty? Oh. Yes. <laughs> nope. Nope. No Magneto. Um, uh, we 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 all thought, or a lot of fans thought, well, okay, she's especially after Agnes revealed herself as Agatha Agatha Harkness, and especially after she started wielding magic at that level. Who thought Doctor Strange or Baron Mordo would have shown up? Who, who thought that I was, was a looking for Doctor Strange, honestly, what? because there is the crossover too at the upcoming movie. Yes. Well, yeah, yeah, here's Strange. the thing: uh, because of the pandemic, things were switched around. There was actually a Doctor Strange scene shot for this show because how uh -huh. the original lineup was: this show was going to come out, and then like a month later, Doctor Strange Two was going to come out. But because <laughs> things got pushed around, that scene got deleted. Oh man. Well, I hope that becomes available somewhere. What they did was they added the Doctor Strange stuff to Spider-Man 3, which will then go into Doctor Strange. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Uh, let's see. What, what other fan theories did you guys uh, look forward to happening that did not happen? Mephisto. Thank you. I was about to say that. I, I, think, I think we're still there. I think it's still there because if you look at the backstory when they did the flashback of Agatha and um, how she she acted like she was scared but she wasn't scared like like it seems like there's there's something else in the background and then especially the thing that she told Wanda when she said you don't know what you've done what you've unleashed well and also. I was reading an article today that was quoting, um, was it Jack Schaefer, who is the writer producer? And he was saying that a sequel is not out of the question, not out of the question. Um, what was the quote? I'm sorry. I took notes. It's really sad. <laughs> um, oh, no, that's wonderful. <laughs> I do stuff like this. Um, I love nerds. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. Is it beyond the realm of possibility when he was talking about a sequel in a second season? So truthfully, we could see Mephisto in a second season. Please. Right. Please. Okay. Sorry. I, I, Johnny, your question was uh, fan theories that didn't come, your favorite theories that didn't come true. That we haven't mentioned, yeah. Yeah. My favorite theory that didn't come true is my favorite theory because it didn't come true. And that is that there was any other actor that Paul Bettany was thrilled to work with that he hadn't gotten to work with <laughs> other than himself. I am so gloriously happy about that troll. Uh, and the fact that he just came out and said it so there wouldn't be any doubt about the fact that he was trolling. Um, that's my favorite theory that didn't come true, that it was no one else but him. What a glorious, glorious little drop, though. I'm like, oh, my God. I don't know if you're a genius or a jerk. I had to edit myself there. So, yeah. Can, can we talk about Evan Peters, who I still think yes. is going to be Quicksilver in the MCU in the future? Because you don't go out and just hire Evan Peters to play a nobody. No. I, I agree with that, Brian. Um, oh, sorry. 
I think that was um, fan service, then a total fan troll that will be fan service again. Hmm. I, I think I think uh, him being revealed as Ralph Boner. <laughs> it sounds like a fake name. Yeah, it, it um, actually yeah, that's I, a that's a callback to a sitcom. Um, I was watching something about that. Was it Silver Spoons? The best friend to the main character was Boner. named. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So that was a sitcom mm -hmm. reference. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, you know that that was Ralph that. Agnes kept referencing all throughout the series. My husband, Ralph, who she keeps locked up in the attic. Or that she pulled over from another multiverse, you know. No who wonder knows? her husband, Ralph, was never in the mood. <laughs> <laughs> kind of creepy. <laughs> well, you also have to play a little bit of what if with some of these uh, situations. Uh, there's, we, we clearly know that Wanda has no idea what her full breadth of power is, or at least not until the end has she started to really study it. And uh, does Agnes even know? I mean, the the person that she pulled out of magical ether, she could have accidentally yanked from another universe. I mean, there's all kinds of possibilities they can go back and add in detail to write back into however they want. Absolutely. There, there's a lot of room in, in all of this for them to uh, add context or even retcon with just a line or two of dialogue. Has and, anyone uh, noticed the official retirement of uh, Marvel characters is a solo cabin in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> Have you noticed this yes. thread of like, uh, Thanos and now Wanda and um, Bucky in the hut? Mm -hmm. uh, and you have Wolverine in a cabin, like always. Um, <laughs> there were several of them. We started listening. Well, even uh, Edward Norton's Hulk at the end, he yes, was like Hulk. in a cabin yes. in the woods. Yeah, it's like they all go build a cabin and just go off to some place in a cabin. Well, that's how you go off the grid, right? Yeah, that's I guess like so. the, the trope. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, so, it's so. a hilarious trope, and I almost really want them to do it with somebody completely off the wall, like Rocket. <laughs> <laughs> well, What's this cabin look like? Well, okay, so so for those of you who are hardcore MCU fans, hardcore Marvel Comics fans, when that that drone shot started coming over the the ridge and across the lake, who started having heart palpitations that that was Alkali Lake, and that we were going to get a, 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 a Wolverine Easter egg. <laughs> Did that occur to anybody? No. That's well, what it, what no. occurred to me was uh, no. the place where Wanda goes to in the comics. I forgot. It starts with a W. Uh, Wanda it's, Wonder yeah. Gore. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that may be where it is. That may be uh, the base of Wonder Gore Mountain because in the comics, um, in in the uh, the series, the Avengers storyline written by David Michelini, illustrated by John Byrne, uh, the story arc was called the Knights of Wondergore. Um, Wanda and Pietro go back to where they were born, which was at the base of Wondergore Mountain. And Wanda opens the Darkhold and reads the Darkhold, and she is possessed by the demon Cathan, which is what that final scene was. So, Brian, you may be right. It may be at, at the base of Wondergore Mountain. Yeah, I've also heard some talk that it was the crater uh, from uh, Sokovia that it became a lake, and that could be true. So and yeah, so forth and a lot, a lot of a lot of questions about where it is, or it's just a nondescript remote cabin, and no one will ever do anything with it. <laughs> which, which, from what we got in the series, is probably closer to the truth. <laughs> yes. Um, I wasn't shushing anybody. I'm sorry. I have very loud children that don't listen. They don't know how to be quiet. <laughs> I feel your pain. <laughs> Hence the reason why I'm muted. <laughs> but, but, Willow, yours isn't a child. It's your husband. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea what he's watching on TV, and then he also watches a game streamer. So, oh. well. 
so so you see behind me the TV. My son is playing a, a new Pokemon game. Oh, that's not what he's playing. But he's got he's got his own headphones on, so he can play and not disturb us. Technology is miraculous. <laughs> so now they just have to come up with a way to implant children with a mute button, and we'll be all set. Because <laughs> there's no headphone for that. Oh, wait. That's, that's when they become called... teenagers, you're like, please talk, please talk, please talk, please talk. <laughs> well, I'll tell, a few you, years. I'll tell you what the cure for that is, Nicole. You Alcohol. gotta get you gotta get yourself a big fat Bible. Oh, I was way off. That that has none. Of, it's got to be thick, so there are no words missing. What? And then you just beat the love of God into them. Oh <laughs> Wait, does it work the same way as a phone book and doesn't leave bruises? <laughs> so, it's anyway. more fun though to, to like find the set of encyclopedias. You've got a full magazine of shots in that case. You just now, do we need a disclaimer that we're not actually advocating for beating children? <laughs> I was just going to say that. Please do not beat your children with mission. a Bible. Wait a <laughs> minute. <laughs> it depends. I've met some children. I think we should, like, never mind. Well, I've met a Let's lot stop. of kids that need Jesus. Oh, Lord. There's a oh, special back issue for you. <laughs> Which back uh -oh. issue is the best for slapping around an unruly teen? <laughs> <laughs> the thicker the better yes yeah. i say that from experience <laughs> Ke kelly's first review uh the hawkeye private eye it was 288 pages yeah that, that was a good. big one it yeah was... that sucker that would brain a kid real easily <laughs> <Ow>. <laughs> <laughs> and not to like completely do an advertisement, but it's pretty inexpensive for how much story, how many pages you get for that. So, so once you read it, if you want to brain your child with it, no, no financial loss there. Exactly, you can just replace <laughs> exactly. it. All and right. you don't want to because it's a good book. <laughs> I, I will <laughs> give, I will give the official disclaimer that uh, the views and opinions expressed by the hosts about beating their children with comics and Bibles do not necessarily <laughs> reflect the views of our other hosts, our viewers, or any potential sponsors. But they could. <laughs> oh uh, we'll, we'll still get canceled. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, so they, they, they did something on this show that took me completely by surprise. And I am talking about this uh, white vision yes now i am a huge i'm a huge fan of the avengers uh, i tell people all the time that star wars movies and avengers comic books made me who i am today and the west coast avengers story vision quest that introduced us to the white vision in the comics is universally either loved or hated uh fans are completely split by it and when when we were under the assumption that the vision in Wanda's hex was the body that she stole, because of that, I didn't see white vision coming at all. And when it happened, I immediately messaged Brian and all I said was, holy crap. And he knew exactly what I was talking about. Brian, did you see that coming at all? Well, I I was kind of on the fence. I was like, if they're doing, you know, these three stories all rolled into one, uh, Spectral Vision was going to – I don't know. I thought they were going to do it, but not the way that they did it. Hmm. Okay, but so take it from a – I'm not – I knew nothing of White Vision. Like, I know nothing. Uh -huh. So the only thing he did, and he told me nothing, which is odd because usually he likes to, <laughs> you know, explain comics to you. He likes to revel in his trivial knowledge. Let me um, flex my knowledge. <laughs> but um, I knew nothing about it, and then I just kind of like, I I felt like there should have been something more climactic. Like mm -hmm. I, 
like he just looked at him and then he was gone. And I was like, well, okay. What was everybody so excited? <laughs> Cause I've never read the, I've never read it. So I don't know anything about it. I was like, well, I was expecting something to be like, you know, something more than, Ooh, and then done. And now the dog won't shut up. I don't, this is life. <laughs> live theater everybody um now clyde hall just said i really wanted the aerospace engineer to be monica's childhood scroll friend playing hayward and moving sword assets into place for monica there was a lot of fan theories that hayward was uh, a scroll or a cree sleeper and there were a lot of people who were looking forward to monica's uh, childhood scroll friend showing up, um, but none of that happened either. And yeah. it, I, I heard a lot of people say that Hayward, uh, that Hayward could have been Ultron. Yep, I saw that. There, one. there was mm -hmm. a theory about wow. that. Yep. And I forgot logistically. Uh, did they restore the the vision scraps to create White Vision, or is White Vision yes. a new creation? <laughs> No, they they dismantled him, figured out what made him tick, reassembled him, and used Wanda's hex magic right to reanimate him. Yeah, uh, well, with new programming. I and the scene where Wanda goes and where we thought she stole the body. Mm -hmm. um, they if. If you look at the breakdown, and a lot of YouTubers and critics, uh, like reviewers, broke that scene down that the body was already built and they just took it apart for show because Hayward wanted to see what she could do because like they had these saws and stuff and they were like saw like he's vibranium and well in the comics antimanium is the strongest uh, metal ever but vibranium and MCU is the strongest so like they were just slop you know, sl sloppy with, you know, the way they were sawing, if you look. So that was all, like, head games. Because if you look at Hayward's expression, like, as he's standing behind Wanda, and then she breaks the glass and goes down, like, so I think what they did was they already had the body built, and they just kind of just took him apart just to see if she could bring him back. Hmm. Hmm. That that's an interesting uh, theory. I I'll have to go back and watch that scene and and see if I agree. Yeah, watch his facial expressions. And more what? and more understanding that it's just the guy with absolutely no human power or superhuman powers that's just a douchebag. Yes, yeah. which I kind of like that. I, I'm cool with the government goon that's just doing his thing, and it 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 doesn't really have some other layer like. There can always just be that government dude that's a little bit of a pain. Uh, you know, you, you kind of get, I guess if you're a big enough X-Files fan, you're more comfortable with that than the average. Like, everybody's got to be a secret somebody uh, that, you, that you see come from the fandom. Mm -hmm. uh, I find that we don't rely on that as much, or we shouldn't rely on that as much with Marvel. Now, if you're watching a CW show, Google every name that comes up because they're probably somebody. But uh, I don't think they load that up as much in Marvel as the fans presume. Yeah, and and I know Thunderbolt Ross is is a good guy, and he's a jerk too. But you think he would have approved of what Hayward was doing? No, uh, like no, 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 that's too far. Right. No. Well, oh, go, go ahead. ahead, go ahead, Kelly. I was just going to ask: Did the show ever explain where she got the deed from to the property? Vision bought it. Vision got it. He bought it for yeah. her. Well, he bought it for her, but did but when did she when did he give it to her? We don't know that. They they didn't During show that. Infinity War, probably when they were like, weren't they like in England or whatever? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Oh, he probably okay. bought it like sometime between Civil War and Infinity War. Yeah, because okay. they, they, they were together in the in the apartment where he was talking about like their forever. Right. Oh. And then so I I just assumed that out of normal, like if you cohabitate with someone, you acquire right. their things and he probably had it like put away somewhere. Well, but that's not exactly 
what that scene was, uh, Kelly or Nicole. I'm sorry. Um, they, they between Civil War and Infinity War, there was a three year period, and Wanda, Vision, well, Wanda, Cap, uh, Natasha, and the Falcon and Winter Soldier were in hiding. They they were they were fugitives. Vision was not a fugitive. He had signed the Sokovian Accords, and technically he should have been arresting Wanda, but he was camping out with her. And um, so so that scene in an apartment wasn't them living together. It was them having a rendezvous in secret. Yeah, that makes sense. See, yeah. But you know, like, so now, uh, did, we still acquire people's stuff. What do we think about where White Vision went off to after the uh, the <sighs> fabulous computer software logic showdown that that would be fight turned into? Which I've heard, I've seen people complain that they didn't get the throwdown that they had in mind. Like it was it was a pretty good throwdown, but I yeah. I love that it boiled down to computer outsmarting computer but then the 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 new woke if you will uh vision where did he sail off to <laughs> that's a great question um that's a great question lucas because i thought at, at the very least fake vision would have said oh hey by the way i freed the real vision's memories and you should go to him right that never happened that, that we're aware of, right? Wanda doesn't know that he's been restored. His memories have been restored. So where did he go? Did he go to, well, where could he go? Avengers compound was destroyed. I, you know, just who knows? We don't know. It was a maybe, maybe uh, the, the feelings were overwhelming for him because he says, I am vision. And then he flew away. So I'm thinking maybe it was just overwhelming for him, and he went somewhere to to the to collect himself. Well, absolutely, but where? Where does he go? Does he go maybe. to Wakanda? Does he go to the sewers with the Ninja Turtles? What happened? <laughs> maybe I'm voting he's up Wakanda in space with the with the new shield. Yeah, that, yeah. That that thought crossed my mind. He we went straight to Nick Fury for a download. Okay, all right, help me make well, sense. Well, but do, how do, you does, think, do you think that they're going to do a, like a West Coast Avengers, but since they're doing Young Avengers, Avengers, uh, that they'll kind of mix the two and White Vision will be part of that Young Avengers team? Well, it, it's possible. He could be he could be like the uh, mentor of the group. Uh, I don't know that they'll do that, though. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if White Vision shows up in Falcon and Winter Soldier. That could be a thing. Yeah. Because the the whole premise in the trailers of Falcon and Winter Soldier is that you know the Avengers are disbanded. You know, there are no heroes. They need to reassemble. And we know that Don Cheadle's gonna be returning as War Machine in that series. So it wouldn't surprise me one bit if at the end of that series we see a new team of Avengers assemble. I could, I could get down with that. I like, but that. I'm not predicting anything at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I just want full on acknowledgement of, uh, of the Falcon Captain America. That's I, I want to not dance around. I want somewhere in this series. I want the red, white, and blue suit with the shield and the wings done. Yes. And I've wanted you're, it since he showed up. You're, you're going to get it. <laughs> by by the end of that series, you'll get it. But they're they're going to go through some heartache. But are they going to um, give Sam the uh, serum like they did in the comics? They didn't give him the serum. I thought there was a run that they gave. Like he wasn't as strong as Steve Rogers, well, but that, that he's always had uh, slightly enhanced human strength because he's actually a mutant. Oh, huh. yeah, yeah, because. Uh, in the comics, Falcon can talk to Aviary. He has a, a telepathic link with birds, wow. and um, yeah. So now, is mutant, that a latent uh, mutant ability that he developed over time, or is that something he's always had? 
Well, they introduced it like within the last 10 years. So they, they kind of said it. Oh, hey, by the way, Sam has this ability now. And it's it kind of a it. push to give all of them some sort of superhuman something. I just I just wonder because like we had this whole discussion in the car about that, like how I love Anthony Mackie and I always loved Falcon just a little bit more because he wasn't superhuman. Like I, I tend to just like the non superhuman superheroes. Well, n neither neither is uh, Hawkeye. That's either, why I like Hawkeye too. <laughs> either either iteration. Kate Bishop has no superhuman powers. Um, so was was uh, comic book Falcon then using those powers to relate to Red Wing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And haven't we kind of sidestepped that in the MCU since Red Wing yes. tech? Yes. Well, yeah. well, no, kind kind of not really because they've they've used Red Wing in a tech form that's connected to his goggles in the comics. Sam can use birds and psychically connect with birds to surveil his surroundings, use them as surveillance to spy, um, you know, see things, you know, at far distances. So, so he's Brandon. <laughs> he's Bran. You see, he just needs a wheelchair and some white eyes and he'll just use all the crows. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny I'm just trying to figure out how he's going to catch the shield because any normal person that throws the shield and it comes back, their arm's going to break in a million pieces. Well, Based was, on it being vibranium. I mean, that's why Cap, he can catch it because he's superhuman. Yeah. Maybe Unless they use some kind of Tony Stark tech or whatever, like... Nanomanic. Well, maybe the suit well, will compensate somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His suit is is vibranium alloy. It's designed by Shuri in Wakanda. That I mean, that's the comics explanation. Is T'Challa gave him the wings and and his his armor. So there you go. But we're not talking about Falcon and Winter Soldier yet. We're still talking about One Division. Um. Let's talk about Monica Rambeau for a minute. Yes. So when she steps in front of Tommy and Billy and, and the bullets pass through her but slow down, did it strike anybody else that she did not act surprised? Honestly, I kind of thought that she did not realize she was doing that, that it was subconscious, that she just basically went into that mode. Yeah, that, that that checks out. I feel like she had a, a certain level of just confidence that it, that it was going to, something was going to work, almost instinct. So that, that kind of lines up, yeah. I still Kelly, think she had I her see the wheels turning there. I kind of feel like, I kind of feel like he is right. I hate to say that. Um, that I really think that it wasn't just the hex that changed her molecular makeup, but also that there was already something she was prone to some other ability that she got from being in space or from the blip or whatever the heck it was. Like, I just feel like there was something that happened during that time where she kind of already knew. And who knows what, what like based on being around Captain Marvel, uh, Carol Danvers, like what? What is she radiating off of her body? Well, we'll find out in Captain Marvel two, because uh, that that I think is going to be a make, and we might even find out in Miss Marvel. Uh, I don't know if they have plans for Monica Rambeau to appear in Miss Marvel, but definitely her story has not ended, uh, as we see from the first post credit scene in the finale. Um, the uh, scroll agent uh, references Nick Fury. Your friend up there, um, who has apparently been completely aware of everything that Hayward was doing. Maybe. 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 Nick <laughs> Fury. I'm worried about it. Maybe. I mean, he's, just, he's just kicked back in his fake beach, having a Mai Tai, watching things go down, you know. <laughs> 
you don't you don't think Nick Fury knows everything? I don't know. No. Maybe. Oh, Maybe. absolutely. No. He has shield agents everywhere. He at least <laughs> wants people to think he knows everything. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that works. He knows a lot of things, though. He knows a lot more than. I mean, we well, could find out any number of uh, people involved in the storyline have been scroll plants that he's used for intel. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely uh, what's going on. And I, I know that uh, Monica's story will carry her through Secret Invasion which is going to be a, another series on um, on Disney+. Plus. And Scott Hitchcock asks, could it be Captain Marvel who's up there? I don't think so. I think they're talking about Nick Fury. Do you guys agree? I, I thought <laughs> Shield has a new base. Shield has a new base, and we're going to see it in the upcoming movie or whatever uh, iteration they decide to do for the next line up. Well, the next time we see her is in uh, Thor Love and Thunder because they did announce that she's uh, she filmed a part for that, which that's filming now, and that comes out next summer, I think. The next time we see who? Mom. Captain Marvel. Oh, okay. Brie yeah. Larson, Captain Marvel? Yeah, Brie, Lar Brie Larson was in Australia filming a scene for the new Thor movie. Huh. That's interesting. That movie is becoming very crowded to me. Is it? Well, if you, if you think each film, though, they they branch branch things off to the MCU. So yeah, no, I, I get it. But you got uh, Thor, the Guardians of the Galaxy, Jane Foster, a um, couple of other characters who have been announced to be appearing in that movie. So Valkyrie and I, I don't know. It just seems very crowded right now to me. We'll see. Well, the Guardians will be done in the half, first half of the movie. I think they'll go their separate ways. Well, we'll we'll see. So so we've got we've got these two streams already breaking off. With Wanda, her path is going to go through Spider Man three and end in Doctor Strange two, the Multiverse of Madness. Then you've got Monica Rambeau, who is going into Captain Marvel 2, Secret Invasion. And it wouldn't surprise me if she plays a role in um, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. Mm. Um, that would be a good use for her in the quantum realm, but we'll see. And then the other two characters who have unlimited potential at this point is Jimmy Woo, Jimmy Woo and Darcy. Yes. Yes. Who wants to see an X Files style show with Jimmy Woo and Darcy? Me. Okay, I must be in the opposite direction here. I like. I want something new. I don't want to see an X Files like show. I want something new with these characters. I want to see what they what they can provide us as far as entertainment goes. But. Yeah. Okay. Throw in some like some specters. Throw in some like the the Marvel monster stuff. But you know what? Let Let's actually turn it into something more thrilling, rather well, than the X Files. Well, there's Agents of Atlas. A, yeah, Agents of Atlas. I was just gonna say there's a huge depth for um, them to play with. Uh, and look, um, Monica Rambeau was. Um, she oh she wasn't uh, agents fatless she was agent of hate uh, that's a whole other thing we, I'm not going to get into that but um, agents of Atlas Jimmy Wu led that team and still leads that team in the uh, comics and in the comics Shang Chi is a member of agents of Atlas right now which is one of the next big Marvel movies coming out so there's all these potential connections. Well, and what characters do, do we uh, do we know of that stand to make an appearance in the Loki series? I mean, that seems like a place where Wu could show up. Mm -hmm. Probably. And it's not like he's one of their most expensive actors, but his value is shooting up through the roof at this point. What, what about Agatha? 
I mean, what, her status is a little. Yeah. I, I I'm not sure what I think her status is. She's either fried into thinking that she's just a regular busybody, but the rest of the town is dehexed. It, it, there's an ambiguity there on how <laughs> she leaves the series. But the hex is breaking down, so I would venture to say somebody that has magical abilities at the level of Ab that Agatha does should be able to break through that. Yes. It almost no. felt like she was being stashed. Like uh, uh, my son and I were talking about, it, like we almost expected to see her trapped in a little hex bubble by herself somewhere uh, in some scene uh, or something, some kind of nod that she's in stasis of some sort, because it really sounded like that was the plan. Like, I'm going to well, zap you and keep you here for safekeeping. Well, Which and I think that the the inference there is that she is cast, she is stuck as that personality in that town in reality without the hex. Because the, the, she, was, she was placed in that position she was transformed and locked into that position while the hex was still up mm -hmm. and while the runes were in place around the hex. So the spell was locked in and she remains within the spell outside of the hex until Wanda decides differently. Yeah. Okay, and we'll definitely I'll see her again because if you, uh, I mean, they wouldn't do a throwaway line like, uh, what did Wanda tell her? She's like, until I need you or whatever, you're stuck like this. Yeah, and I'll, I'll see you. And then Agatha, which I took away, she goes, unless I see you first. Well, and in the original, in the comic her. books, Agatha was she was killed and resurrected, but one of the killings was in association with her interaction with. Wanda's children, if I remember correct. And the final scene, that closing credit scene was Wanda's children crying out for help. So I can't help but think that there could be some tie-in to Agatha there. Hmm. There could be. And Agatha was her mentor in, in the comics. Yes. So, yeah, that remains to be seen. Well, she may not need a mentor after out of body night schooling her way through the uh, dark hole. <laughs> and well, Agatha. So, so that that brings up a whole nother thing about the dark hold. The last time we saw the dark hold, and there's debate among fandom about whether or not Agents of Shield really counts or not. Mm. Um, <laughs> I have my own theory about that. I think that the Agents of Shield timeline deviated. And then came back in their their final season, but um, season four of Agents of Shield before they deviated from the timeline, the Darkhold was present and was a huge uh, story element mm -hmm. with uh, with the uh, framework and in particular with Ghost Rider. And mm -hmm. in Doctor Strange, there was a book missing from the Ancient Ones library. And so my personal fan theory is that, uh, you know, the Darkhold was stolen uh, from someone somewhere, passed through uh, the hands of uh, Ghost Rider and uh, Aida in the framework and then came into uh, Agatha's possession. It was also and, in the Runaways. The oh, one that's girl, right. That's right. The one girl's mom's a witch. Yeah, that's right. Oh. I forgot about that. Huh. Nico. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And and yeah, but they didn't explain how she got the dark hold. So there's all of these loose threads that either they're going to ignore and and or they're going to tie up. Wouldn't it be interesting if these dark holds are all independent dark holds from different multiverses? That would be very interesting and very likely. Yeah, that see, that be, was going to be my thing when I was when she heard the voices of the twins. Maybe that was the twins in another, uh, in a in the multiverse somewhere. I agree with that. Where I they can actually exactly. be real, right? Because in again in the source material in the comics, Billy and Tommy are real. They 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 mm -hmm. they start off as the shards of Mephisto's soul, 
Mm -hmm. um, they get absorbed into the demon master pandemonium and vanish. And then after, after Heroes Reborn and the MCU is rebooted, Tommy and Billy are teenagers and show up again. And they're real, flesh and blood. Yeah. Kelly, you need to do uh, the Young Avengers Children's Crusade or just the Young Avengers review and talk about that. Yes. Uh, yeah, the original Young... You're talking about the original run of Young mm -hmm. Avengers, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So good. Yeah, by Heinberg and Chung. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't have a physical copy yet, but I'll get it. Because I used to have a Marvel Unlimited subscription, so that's where I did, read a lot of my Marvel books. So I have to get some physical copies. Is that the run where um, is it Billy or Tommy that's involved with Hawkling? Uh, it's Billy. Yeah, Billy Wiccan. Yeah. Yep. I know is that there... was like a, that was a big. Uh, Nicole's looking at me. She did, that was a big because uh, like a gay storyline. Like they. And it was like it made headline news and stuff. It was not just well, yeah, it was relatively recent too, right? Well, in in the recent story, Empire, uh, they got married and now they're ruling okay. the Cree Scroll uh, Empire together, uh, and they're also uh, heading up the new Guardians of the Galaxy in the comics. So good for them. <laughs> lot of lot of complicated pieces moving. Yes. All right, guys. What what else uh, do you take away? Were you guys heartbroken by the ending? Did you was it satisfying for you? How did you ultimately feel about the uh, finale that we got? So, as the resident not so read worthy nerd, um, <laughs> in the general essence of what I expect from the MCU, I kind of expected there to be more fanfare or more climax, but as I started to step back from it and like after initially watching it and thinking about it, I was like, you know, this was the story that they had to tell for us to get the Scarlet Witch, you know, to get her to where she is yeah. learning and cultivating mm -hmm. and, and doing what she's doing. So it was kind of like an origin story in the essence that it kind of led us to where she needed to be, not to, to put a nice little bow on things, you know, like I think, Sometimes we have that big that big fight and then we get some sort of, you know, payoff right away. I feel like we're going to get it later. And I really like the fact that they um, kind of talked so much about grief and they talked so much about um, like that that mental health issue that like she she knows she did it but she doesn't know how and that it's all tied to her emotions like i really kind of like that service to mental health that they kind of shot us to that's just me being over analytical and not so read worthy nerdy but well i definitely <laughs> think they killed it uh, you know it, it they didn't need to do all the stuff all the theories um overall it, it still stands for me likely to be one of the most unique and creative mm -hmm. series I've ever seen. The, the, the constant loops of meta and self-referential and fourth wall and all this stuff on top of it being just an American television commentary uh, piece of media. I mean, I kind of almost expect this show to be required viewing and discussion in media classes and filmmaking schools. Just when it's all said and told, uh, it, it's it's more than just a comic book thing. It's it's a piece of, of referential art on our medium and our culture. And it also, I think, should be um, studied in film classes when they talk about chemistry within your within your, you know, within the people that you're working with too, because. Elizabeth Olsen and Paul Bettany, Bettany uh, just blew it up. Like there was that, I don't know. There's just so much like, like I would buy the fact that they could literally be together. Like they, they could be married in that wonderful little world. Yeah. You know, 
Like, yeah, that was spectacular. DL? Up, oh, DL, you're muted. Hold on. <laughs> Your mic is muted. <laughs> <laughs> How'd that happen? <laughs> I'm trying to unmute it and it won't let me because it says you, you can't unmute your guest. Their mic isn't connected. <laughs> That's interesting. It was Agatha all along. <laughs> well, maybe maybe, maybe, maybe she should just drop out and it's all deal. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm going to drop you out and bring you back in. We'll see if that fixes it. Um, so, sure. uh, Willow and Kelly, I saw your um, the the wheels turning when when I asked about the uh, you know whether you you felt satisfied or disappointed by the uh, conclusion. Yes, yes. Um, okay, so I'm going to say theor coming up with theories and engaging with the fan community has been the most fun I've had watching a show in years. I don't even care that my theories didn't come true. I don't care. I had so much fun. <laughs> this has been, that part of it was really great. And then when you get to the actual show, this show it was a masterpiece. Like it really was. It was like Luca said, the um, just the love letter to American television, but then it worked with the tie-ins to the MCU, but also you didn't have to watch the MCU to enjoy this show, I think. And it was one of the more realistic, um, just one of the more realistic treatments of grief and entertainment that I've ever seen which is just it was incredible elizabeth olsen really portrayed the grief well had one of the most quotable lines about how grief is just love persevering which is poetry just mm -hmm. oh yeah just kiss <laughs> um so the the ending like i was heartbroken that pietro didn't come back to us but that's the story that needed to be told. It was a story about a woman dealing with her grief and she couldn't get her loved ones back. And even Vision flying off, he needed to do that. Like if she had Vision back alive at the end of that, it would have kind of cheapened the story they were telling. So mm -hmm. I think I think it was perfect. I think it was perfect just as it was, but I had fun. I sure had fun coming up with crazy theories. D DL, are you are you catatonic all of a sudden? <laughs> <laughs> and she's like frozen. She froze. Now your video is frozen. We got your audio back, oh. but your video is frozen. She looks very sad. Oh, you know? can, oh my. can I just say what Kelly was saying about the like the fan interaction with theories? Yeah, I didn't care if they came true or not. But can we all agree that everyone was not arguing? Like everyone was like, we we weren't fighting. We didn't, you know, we weren't talking about an election. We weren't talking about racism. We were we were all talking about one common thing, and that was and it brought us together. And I thought that was awesome. It was just the joy of, of being able to interact about something that was so powerful for us. Like, you know, I I I want to mention that what Kelly said about the 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 um the quote is that um i apparent i will apparently i only cry for certain things but like that <laughs> entire episode when he said that i just i i really did i cried and i kind of i sort of almost ugly cried because it's very true like it was a perfect depiction of grief it was a perfect depiction of how women can only accept and move forward with the loss that we sometimes feel when we lose our children or when we lose our loved ones. Like, where do you go? But hopefully up, like, and I hope that's where she's going is that, you know, she's going to revel in that power and become, 
the amazing character that she is. Well, I think it really, um, it serves some underserved characters and storylines yes. to cap. It, like people view this as a kickoff of the next uh, phase or whatever, but I also view it as like a put, putting the top back on the bottle after we've done this whole infinity arc, right? Like there was this loose end, there was this unresolved situation where you could have capped these stories off a little more with characters that could also develop them further. And she was one of the most underplayed. Everybody gets their big surge to some extent out of that whole crew, except she's left standing next to a, a lake with you know a dead partner and talking about it with the next most depressed Marvel character that we can find in the crowd. And giving her this opportunity to escalate to the Scarlet Witch is a great cap, I think, to her arc thus far. DL Memphis is back. I she think. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 We, we, we hear and see you. Wonderful. Where, where was Cabana Boy then? He was upstairs working on something, evidently. I need to hire a new cabana boy. <laughs> so so, what, so we've been chatting behind the scenes, and what happened was the plug on her computer came out, and the whole thing shut down. The battery died. Everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so everything died. It was DL all along. It was. <laughs> do, 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 do. Like, the, the, the more the black spreads down my hands, the more that it's like, you know, evil taking over. So we're going to blame it on that. <laughs> and and just before we lost you, DL, you started to share <laughs> something that seemed significant. About, I'm sure it was. Because I, I asked <laughs> the question, were you satisfied or disappointed with the, the finale? You know, honestly, um, I am not, like Nicole, I am not a true reader and follower of Marvel. And I hate to say that. Um, I do love the comics. I do love the Marvel universe and the cinematic universe. And um, I, was a real, I was really expecting something more along the lines of House of M. Um, I was expecting something a lot darker. And um, I'm kind of glad... I was emotionally invested in the, in the series at the end of it. I'm like sitting there and I'm like, I'm not crying. I'm crying. I'm not crying. But I mean, it was, I was really, I was really broken up. I also cried at Lilo and stitch. So there's that. I'm just fair warning. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I was very emotionally invested in this show. And one of the things that I really liked about it, because I was expecting the whole House of M, that very, very dark, um, no more mutants, the whole, you know, the, the, the death of her children, all of that. And we left with hope. I mean, first of all, she got herself out of the situation. She wasn't reliant on uh, Dr. Strange or Professor X to come in and save her. So we saw a development of strength that wasn't necessarily strength with her being crazy. Cause I mean, she is depicted as being one of the most unstable mutants ever, mm -hmm. but um, white, white vision. When he left that last statement of I am vision and he flies away and now he is out in the real world. There was an element of hope that I saw on the end of that, that I really liked that I wasn't expecting. So, and then when you hear her children, um, it even makes you, a bit more hopeful. I know it was a distress call, but it's still a bit more hopeful. So I was kind of hoping I was foreseeing something very dark and very sinister at the end, but it really just seemed a lot more hopeful. And I like that. Well, I think that final scene with her duplicate, her, 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 you know, whatever her doppelganger reading the dark hold is a bad sign. Yes, because that does, uh, if I remember correct, people who have read The Dark Hold either venture into madness or corruption. Is that yeah, correct? They're, they're possessed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Or will it be a, a weird power swerve where she gets enough knowledge to go through the journey and become a master of everything? Hmm. Yes. Well, you know, in all honesty, <laughs> yeah, re I always thought. And, and correct me if I'm wrong. I always thought that 
Scarlet Witch was more of her name and a moniker, not a classification of her skill set. You're, you're correct. So with them actually giving her a classification and saying that there is an entire chapter that's devoted to her and that she is going to be more powerful than the Sorcerer Supreme, does that not indicate that she has the abilities to be more powerful than Doctor Strange and so therefore be able to manage the corruption and the and and what comes alongside reading that well i don't think she's gonna be more powerful than dr strange in the mcu because a lot of people i know they say well this happened in the comics well the comics are the comics the movies are the movies that's how it's gonna be um dr strange is really just a normal person i mean for the things that he learned if you've seen his movie uh he was just a regular surgeon and he learns the art of magic. Like there was that scene from the end of WandaVision that uh, was pretty much the same scene that Dr. Strange, when he was sleeping mm -hmm. and you see him at the foot of the bed, re reading, reading all the books. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The so I'm just wondering point. how she figured out how to do that so fast. But if but you, but if you think about magic, like in general, like when you're talking about magic and I don't know how it, appeals to um, the MCU, but in the, just the essence of magic, like magic is neither good nor evil. It's the doer that possesses the ability to make it that way. It's the intention that they come with. So when Agatha, what I got stuck on was when Agatha says, you are the Scar Scarlet Witch, there is more power in, in you. You can, you know, you have all of this that the, the power resides in her and it's what she puts out there then with the magic. Like that's just like the overall understanding of magic that I have, like in like ending with a K, not a C, but oh, um, you're that right. understanding that it's not, it's not the magic that's, that's good or bad. It's the doer of the magic. So maybe having come through this, this part of her journey that she is, more enlightened and more hopeful. Well, and the the one division actually goes back and touches on uh, Agatha's history, which is she is Sa uh, she is at the Salem witch trials, and I think I saw somewhere that they were referencing that she might have even come from um, a Wiccan background. So if you start dealing with um, magic in that aspect you're correct magic is neither black nor white it's gray and it is the it's based on the doer and it's the practitioner and that can change from moment to moment second to second with the intentions because just because i do something that is good in light doesn't mean that i'm not going to get angry in the next five minutes yeah yeah hey willow you you had something to add to that <laughs> so Kit, I, the whole the whole series as a whole was beautifully done. Um, the the only issue, like Wanda and Vision, the relationship, it, it just I did not like it in in the reading it in the comic books or watching it on um, on the cartoons. I was never a huge fan of them as part of uh, the the Avengers. And I, I love the fact that they managed to bring these two, these two characters and basically humanize them both in a very special way. Um, dealing with mental illness in the MCU is, is being beautifully done. And uh, it's definitely something that we all have to talk to, uh, talk about because being nerds, we all hey, we all have our own mental instabilities. Um, <laughs> at least I do, anyway. I don't know about the rest of you. <laughs> I, I have no idea normal. what you're talking about. <laughs> Dude, we're all fine. We're but, <laughs> nothing to see here. <laughs> but We've got two of us on here who identify with the villain in the piece. I think. <laughs> I know at least one of us gravitates to crazy witch a lot. <laughs> Kelly. <Kidding>. Exactly. <laughs> but seeing but seeing these two characters uh actually, you know, uh dealing with 
you know, grief and stress and uh, loss is, is empowering to, to us. It's and also a very I, timely message in, uh, I don't know anybody who has dealt with loss over the last year. I know personally I have, and you know, his statement, um, Kelly, you remember it better than I do. Um, uh, grief is love persevering. <laughs> yes. Um, it really touched my heart because I mean, there, I mean, it, it was a very, very timely message. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no, no, by all means. Like, you guys uh, all have, you're, uh, have all, like, masterfully described how you feel about the uh, this show. <laughs> and my takeaway is just, like, like it t completely changed my mind about the characters because it wasn't something that was dealt with in the 90s uh, as I was growing up. And it's like, yeah, they kind of, they kind of did like the loss, the grief, but it, in a comical way. So it didn't click. <laughs> so that that's an interesting point, Willow. So, um, as as a an Avengers comics fan from almost birth, um, you know, I was reading the stories about Vision and Scarlet Witch and their relationship and their romance in the seventies, and they are one of the most beloved couples of Marvel comics. And, you know, uh, basically John Byrne in the vision quest storyline split them apart. And then Brian Michael Bendis shattered any relationship that they had and it's never been restored. And for people who, you know, kind of grew up reading that era in the nineties and two thousands, I can see your point that, you know, their relationship never really worked after no. that. But but in the original, you know, source material in the 70s, I mean, Vision and Scarlet Witch were they they were they were more beloved as a couple than um Reed Richards and Sue Storm. And they were the face of Marvel Comics for a long time in the 70s. That's interesting, yeah. though. Interesting perspective. So I don't know. Uh, I just I just couldn't connect with either character, but now just seeing them interact in a whole different way and like actually tug at the heartstrings. <laughs> one, one totally most, different. One of the most heartbreaking things about this series for me has been um, the mixed reaction from people watching it for the first three episodes. Um, uh, this, mm. this morning, a friend of mine posted, he had just started watching WandaVision and I, he didn't like it. He didn't get it. I said, just hang on till episode four. And so he posted this morning, John was right. Episode four was good. My recommendation is what he put, skip episodes one and one through three and pick up with episode four. And Whoa. And I'm like, you are skipping over all of this wonderful context and texture and this homage to American uh, television and, you know, seeing um, the, the, the work that Dick Van Dyke was a consultant. He was on set working with them. And, um, you know, just all of that in and of itself was beautiful. But then we get to episode eight and now we learn why she has cast her reality the way she has because it's the only way she can, can maintain a connection to the memory of her parents. You know, I don't have any patience for this thing going on <laughs> in our culture where people can't just give something. The, the damn things are 28, 37, 42 minutes long. It, it's not a huge slice of people's life to give some patience to four episodes. It, it's it's astonishing to me that we're alive to see this complete breakdown of understanding story narratives and being. It, I'm I'm thinking back to my D Space Nine fandom, going, if I can suffer through the two slow seasons of that show, you can watch three episodes. Of an Thank you, Lucas. <laughs> okay, I, but so on the plus side. And, and, and I, so I, much I, good TV out there that if something doesn't click, I get why people it's are so weird, though. Like, right. 
Where did these people the thing. come from? But the con constant whining on the internet. No, I, I don't. I, 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 no, sorry. You know, not gonna apply. Click. Just, just move on. If Kelly, you like it, that doesn't mean that everyone else is wrong. Sorry, Kelly. Or, maybe, maybe you can, maybe you can uh, agree with me on this one, but. I stuck through 15 years of Supernatural, and that includes <laughs> Leviathans. That oh, includes, Leviathan. I mean, come on. Like, I if, if so I can many. move on from that and enjoy the fact that it ended the way it ended and I got to see them for 15 years, like I grew up with them, basically, then you know what? People just need to have a little bit of patience and a little bit of understanding about how a story is told. Well, and, and it wasn't just that. It was a masterful homage exactly. to American television history. It, you are it, not a TV fan if you did not enjoy the first three episodes. I mean, oh, and I love the first three episodes. Like, yeah, I, I thought did they too. were amazing. Oh, we're, I we're, like, in a, we're in a, a <laughs> me, 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 you know, now, now, now generation. Yeah. I feel sorry for like if films like The Godfather or Apocalypse Now, like, were coming out just now, I think every it would have the same reaction because like people don't like the slow burn, and I think the slow burn uh, stuff is better than like the instant gratification. I love the stuff that makes you think. Oh, I agree. Well, well I'm just so, saying, I'm just saying, like the little details here pressure you into watching a full season of something that you don't like. But I agree, like three. Three episodes is not too much to ask. It's just. Well, I don't see how you could watch that show, get to the end of the first episode, see that someone's watching the show, and not need to know what that is. And that powers you through anything you have doubts about. It, it, the idea that anybody's impervious to that kind of suspense, it's not like they just did three episodes that made no sense. The first right. episode gives you a big tease, and you've got to know what that is. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like not enough parents are doing their kids justice by by teaching them uh, the past uh, when it comes to television. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up watching uh, I Love Lucy um, and uh, Bewitched and all those other shows, um, and I absolutely I. I loved the monkeys in my teens <laughs> and it was just one of those shows that I was obsessed with and I, I would record it whenever I was at school. But so I think what you just said is the whole problem is that none of those shows are now something that our kids are watching. So like it's time as timely as it was for us to be watching. I love Lucy and bewitched our kids aren't watching shows like A Different World and uh, give me another one that's as symbolic. Well, like like Growing Pains or Family Ties. Or Growing ties. Pains or Family Ties. Our kids aren't watching those because for whatever stupid reason, They're watching we, Rick and Morty we are and letting like them that. watch Rick and Morty and YouTube <laughs> videos that rot their brains. And <laughs> Yep. Sorry, John. I'm sorry. I will say but, this. Um, like, I, was, I was a little bit disappointed that they didn't play with the Marvel logo on every episode because that was one of the other things about the first episode that when people say, oh, just skip one through three, there are so many uh, juicy, amazing artistic choices that are necessary. And as soon as the show started and they started playing with the logo, it's like, Oh, it's on now. And then they did the purple one. Then they did at the at the end. I don't know if anybody caught that. Like over in the corner, there was a purple magic going on in the Marvel logo toward the end of the series. But I thought they should have done that gimmick every single time. I do love a show that plays with aspect ratio and letterboxing to hint you into certain circumstances. Uh, if you watched Westworld, Westworld was masterful at changing mm -hmm. what like the letterbox based on which reality was being presented. And I, I love that stuff, but I wish they would have played a little more. I am glad to see that they're willing to play though, because there's so many people that are stuffy about that. Like, oh no, we don't mess with the studio logo. Mess so, with it all day. So Clyde Hall uh, just commented, several friends entered, this ain't my MCU mode, but most came back and watched the first three episodes to catch up 
after episode four dropped. Did you guys experience that too? Did you see that happening? You know, I, I have, uh, my feed went from uh, the like the first episode going, what is this crap? To, oh, okay, this is interesting. I'm kind of getting into the flow of it. And then all of a sudden it was like, Joy Lawrence invaded my whole feed and it was just, whoa. <laughs> well, my fan base and friend base is very different. Um, I do have friends who are very much into uh, fandoms and comics and stuff, but a lot of the people that I interact with are uh, vintage and pinup. And so <laughs> what I found was a lot of people that I knew were going in and seeing the designs and the structure and talking about the authenticity of the, the wardrobe and the hairstyles and stayed for the story because they fell in love with it, which kind of was me. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting there looking at the wardrobe going, Oh my, I'm going to have to watch this. So, but yeah. <laughs> I told Nicole that if Paul Bentley and Elizabeth Olsen, Bentley and Elizabeth Olsen were transported to that time, I think they would fit in. Like I could see them uh, guest starring on "I Love Lucy" or "I Dream of Jeannie." Uh, it just goes to show what kind of actors we have. And can we say Elizabeth Olsen deserves the Emmy now? Yes. Well, and and if there was a a trend too, like. They they changed with the style of TV show like the cadence and how the, how they talk the the syntax yes. cadence the 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 delivery of the lines the just the way everything was shot was like if you didn't watch it full through because when we got to like the nineties and then the two thousand I didn't never watched Modern Family but apparently that was a thing mm -hmm. and um sorry. But um, sorry again, like late to the party on a lot of things, but I'll probably never watch that one. Well, um, listen, well, I had never seen it either, but as a result of WandaVision, our family has started watching Modern Family. Um, and it's so cool to see what they did in WandaVision. And now I'm seeing the callbacks to what's already been done. And it's a hilarious show, by the way. And th that's the silver lining, Johnny, that, that we, we might throw in while we're busy being cranky about people's uh, critique of, of the slow burn. The side effect that may happen is much like listening to music and you hear a, a loop or a sample and you think, oh, man, what is that? And you may go and figure out where did they sample that from? And then you become a man of a song that's really old that you didn't really know about or think about. A lot of people discover in reverse and it may be that this gives an awakening to a certain segment that didn't have the Nick at Night thing and they didn't have the originals, but then they go, what's this based on? I want to go see that. And, and it might be something that happens. I mean, with our kid, it happened with the Twilight Zone, kind of. He's like, oh, this new thing is pretty cool. Where did this come from? We showed him the old stuff. And, you know, there's there's all this potential for discovery that might be the silver lining. Yeah. My husband and I actually spent a lot of time trying to determine which TV show each episode was mimicking and um, also because I mean there were several within each show mm -hmm. and I, I think mm -hmm. when we got to the end of the, the season and you saw all of this I'm like oh we were right right there but my daughter who is a teenager absolutely loved it um, she is a bit of an old soul herself and I'm, I think that this is going to open up channels for her to view shows that she would never thought about because now we're talking about them when I was uh, in high school in the 90s, um, I had friends that were in drama club and they uh, wanted to go to film school after high school. And they would always uh, talk about like the episode of I Love Lucy. And they always and every single one of them, even though they didn't know each other because, you know, I did part of my high school in San Diego and the rest in Las Vegas. They would always talk about the I Love Lucy when they work at the chocolate factory. Mm hmm. And that was always the episode. They say you need to. Sh this is like the even though it's not the first episode of the of the whole show is to watch the episode first because that is some of the best of that time. And truthfully, that is one of the most mimicked. Uh, Yep. designs that you see in film. As a matter of fact, um, my I have a really good friend and I, and we were doing uh, some vintage fashion shows and some vintage uh, 
um, events and we, we did the whole, I love Lucy chocolate. I mean, like with the pink dresses and the, the chef's hat and stuffing chocolate in her face. And I mean, it, we were in a vintage market doing that and everybody loved it. Everybody immediately knew who it was. My, my, my personal favorite is Vita Vita Medicine. I was just going to say that. <laughs> we have another drink. Let me say that again. <laughs> yeah, that great. So, um, Tony Snipes, um, for those of you who don't know Tony, he is my twin brother. Um, and he says Elizabeth Olsen does deserve an Emmy for this. I would agree. Yeah. And the controversial piece, pace of the storytelling led to the mainstream buzz that the show received. And, and I want to talk about that in a minute. Uh, and then he also adds, everybody has heard of WandaVision, whether they've seen it or not. Genius. And yes, he's right. And, and one of the things yeah. that I wanted to leave on was what this show accomplished. Um, we, we saw it happening with The Mandalorian, where, um, you know, when I was a kid, appointment TV was a thing. Like, if you didn't see that TV show that you love on the night that it aired, you didn't see it until it aired again when they repeated <laughs> the series season, or three years later when they went into syndication. Mm -hmm. You you had to be, make time to, to to make that appointment to see that show, and then along comes on demand, and people can watch shows at any time. And then with the Netflix model, you got shows dropping entire se seasons all at once, and people binge watching them in an afternoon and feeling miserable about their lives afterwards, because it's like if you eat a chocolate cake by yourself, right? You feel horrible about it. And then you're like, what do I do now? What, where, where, what does my life mean now? That happened to me with Luke Cage. I don't want to go into it. But, um, <laughs> but, but Mandalorian really created this hybrid of on-demand appointment TV mm. by dropping one episode a week on the same day. But you could go back later and binge watch it if you wanted to. And WandaVision continued that trend. And what we saw even on a greater scale than The Mandalorian, because we saw it with Mandalorian where you would watch the episode and people would talk for a couple of days all week long about, you know, what happened. And, and I can't wait for the next one. This show it, that took that whole phenomenon to a whole nother level. It's all anybody was talking about. Uh, it, whether they saw it or not, watched it or not, people couldn't help talk about WandaVision and what it could mean. And people would people who hadn't seen the show but knew the comics mm. were commenting on still frames and costumes. And I, I mean, I've never seen anything like it. And I think Disney really and, and Marvel Studios really captured a really sweet secret sauce by recreating that appointment TV feeling, mm. but still giving us the on-demand experience. Which is yet another meta TV culture hit for this creation. Yeah, so Clyde Hall said, also, if you missed an episode, the kids at school the next day would talk about it and make you feel miserable. Disney Plus delivered a return to living for appointment TV. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Johnny, I got a question for you. Before sure. You, uh, before you move us toward a conclusion, you haven't talked about loot. I don't know if you talk about it uh, in these evening episodes as much as Saturday mornings, but I'm curious because I want to know what kind of WandaVision loot everybody has been snagging. And I currently have a lonely Wanda. <gasps> oh! Waiting Thank you. So much. for her matching vision, which I was able to snatch before it drove up to $80. But I have to <laughs> wait Matt. for it. Uh, they did the 50s ones, and I decided there, there's one of him as a human, but he, I mean, people that don't know would just see these in your house and be like, oh, that's cute, black and white TV characters of some kind. But there's one where his head is the vision head with the briefcase and the suit. But that one, it, it, like, shot way up through the roof, and it's going to be a while before I get it because it's a pre-order and a, a big Apple collectibles thing. But um when it comes, they'll, they'll they'll be the perfect little '50s version of these characters. But what are you guys seeing? Do you have you guys snatched up any any yes. Wandavision loot? So so while Brian is grabbing his stuff, I have not yet. 
Um, although there is a, a, a Marvel Legends white vision figure coming out and i'm not a huge pops fan i have a few but i do want that white vision pop um so i will be on the hunt for that and let me give a shout out to a, a shop in middle tennessee for you guys who are in my area um dragonfly comics in white house tennessee probably has the most expansive selection of pop vinyls i've ever seen in any one place so uh, it is worth the trip up there if you're in this area. Cool, Brian. What did, what what do you go? What did you go get? Okay, so last week on Thursday was Emerald City Comic Con, and I got what is probably the hottest Wandavision pops on the market. Well, you can't find them now. Maybe on eBay for like two fifty or more. Wow! Uh, Yay, the twins! <gasps> oh, Halloween! Wow! Oh, yeah. so cute. he was hilarious. He's like, I get a text. I'm sitting at my desk at school and I get a text and it says, Ugh. And I was like, uh, what? And he's like, <laughs> can't find twins. Yeah. Amazon. Amazon was. hiding them. <laughs> and I went, <laughs> Okay. Now I'm going to go home to a Neanderthal and I have no idea why. <laughs> because I don't know what this, what this, like, hi, the, Amazon hides stuff now? Like, what are you talking about? He's like, and then like an hour later I get, got twins. And then there's a whole bunch of emojis. And I was like, <laughs> crisis averted. <laughs> You're like, I hope they're not live human twins. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> I really, well, well, the thing is, no on Thursday boys. at 9 a.m. Eastern time, that was 6 a.m. Pacific, Funko released the Emerald City Comic Con pops. Amazon did not release these pops until about an hour and a half after they were supposed to. Huh. And as soon as I ordered them, they went out of stock. So I was lucky enough to snag them. And now the only way to buy them is on eBay or through a like comic shop, but it's going to be triple digits. Yeah. It's like 120 right now through an independent seller on, uh, on Amazon. So that's probably this, the, the ground floor is 120 and up. I, I will say this too. There is another shop here in middle Tennessee called replay toys. And uh, they specialize in, you know, aftermarket stuff, but they do not price gouge. They they um they uh stuff that's like I I got a a, a Cara Dune pop after they had started skyrocketing for thirteen dollars for them because they wow. didn't wow. they didn't price gouge it. Um, so that's another resource. Replay toys in Middle Tennessee to check out. So. I got a question for Lucas. You mentioned uh, Big Apple collectibles. You've bought stuff from them before? Uh, no, this is the first experiment in that. <laughs> yeah, because I just found out about uh, them today, and because uh, they have mystery boxes, and I think I may hop into that. Hey, that's that's Not Mike. Awesome. That's uh, Mike Carbonaro's uh, outfit. Not the not the Mike Carbo YouTuber guy, but Mike Mike Carbo, the huge comic book collector guy who uh, hosts the Big Apple Comic Con every year. Um, he's he's a real dude. I, I mean, he's he's the real thing. So it um, seemed pretty reputable from what I could tell. I had never shopped it before, but it uh, it looked like it was decent. And on the day that I did that. That figure was was sixty bucks on Amazon already, and I was wrestling with whether I was obsessed with having that matching pair. <laughs> would pay that much because I'm not a pop. I'm very fine. Like I purposefully invest in pops that I think represent something I want seen. I don't try to get all of it. Um, but uh, you know, I looked at it and thought, you know, it's a twenty-two dollar pre-order. You know, how much could go wrong? <laughs> what I really hope they do with this uh, Marvel Legends retro line, wouldn't it be great if they did a black and white Vision and Scarlet Witch in the retro style? That would be style? neat, yeah. 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 Did, did you see, 
these are out of my budget. I'll never be able to afford a hot toy, uh, which are like two something. They just released Vision and Scarlet Witch in her new outfit that you see her in at the end of WandaVision. Uh, I don't know if you've seen photos, but uh, oh, yeah. if you look them up. Oh my God. They look, I mean, hot toys in general look really good. That's why you spend like 200 some odd dollars for them. Yeah, yeah. gorgeous. Yep, yep, highly collectible. There will be there will be a Marvel Legends line that will come out, um, and uh, I'll look, I'll collect that definitely because I love the Marvel Legends stuff, um, and I might pick up a pop or two. And uh, DL Memphis vanished for a minute, and she is back. Did you oh, get the loot, DL? Did I? No, actually, uh, honestly, all of the loot that I'm interested, like the Wanda or not the Wanda, the. Uh, Agatha Pop is on uh, its pre-order at this point, but um, I have seen a lot of really cool, I have a tendency to gravitate towards characters that I love and that I intend to cosplay and buy mm -hmm. everything yep, yep. surrounding those characters. So um, yeah, I've seen like socks, but right now my big focus is creating the Agatha cosplay. So I no, I, I do it. Yeah. I can't wait to see. I'm sorry. I know. I'm like, yes. <laughs> I'm drilling. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's kind of where I am. I don't have any great loot at this point, but um, I'm I'm working on getting. Every uh oh. Uh -oh. oh no! Froze. We just well, got her back. Yeah, yeah. We just got her back, and she froze again. I. It was Agatha all along. Um, <laughs> Well, so that that's probably a good place to uh, start winding down. Uh, any any last thoughts about WandaVision? Um, do you think it? I, I think it was a great uh, opening chapter for Marvel Phase Four. Yeah, I mean, are you looking forward to the making of on Friday? Oh, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that that had gotten past me. When is that? It, this Friday. Mm -hmm. And then next, and then next week, Falcon and Winter Soldier starts, and yeah. then after that ends, the the following week of the finale of that, you'll do a making of, and then I think Black Widow Loki. comes out. Yep, Black Widow comes out in theaters, and then Loki the next week. We've been uh, we did a Captain America and Winter Soldier rewatch Sunday night, probably Friday night. We're doing Age of Ultron, and then I'm trying to encourage a. All day Saturday or Sunday, or break it in half, uh, straight through watch of One Vision back to back episodes just for the fun of it, mm -hmm. and leading into, of course, Falcon and Winter Soldier. Yep, yep. Kelly, you were about to uh, comment on the opening salvo of MCU Phase Four. Oh, I was just going to say, I hope we have even half as much fun watching Falcon and the Winter Soldier and coming up with crazy theories as we did with this one. Oh, yeah. Now, one last question, and, and this is kind of interesting because, you know, Black Widow got pushed, pushed, pushed again. Um, do you think that this show has rekindled any kind of anticipation for Black Widow or has... Black Widow just been a victim and, and had all of the oxygen sucked out of the room by WandaVision. Ooh. No, mm. I think people are still looking forward to Black Widow. Yeah, I think I think people are, but I'm worried that they're this obsession these studios have with just keeping on kicking the can down the road worries me that people are gonna be so like, oh well, it's about damn time when the movie comes out that the excitement is is dulled. And I think the same applies to like 007. They're doing the same thing with that movie. Like, just stop it. Just release it. And, you know, quit kicking it. Well, and after a while, you have so much anticipation for a release that it cannot even compare. Um, Wonder Woman 1984. Um, I loved the original Wonder Woman. I love Wonder Woman. But w I waited so long for 84, and it was such a letdown, even with Linda Carter in the final scenes. I was. I, I think that you can actually drag it out too long to the point that people are going to completely lose interest, not only in the character, but the, just the story in general. It, and I'm worried about Ghostbusters and Top Gun and all these things having the same problem. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Clyde Hall says if Falcon and Winter Soldier is anything as good as this, it's once again, a great era to be a comics fan TV addict. I will agree Clyde Hall. 
Um, everything is awesome, but there are a lot of people who still aren't happy about it. And that's a conversation <laughs> for another day. Oh, okay. uh, Tony Stipe says they should not do a season two of WandaVision. I agree. It was well done. Leave it as a finished masterpiece. Amen, my brother. Testify. Yeah, well, Ted Feige said that some of these shows will get second seasons, but not right away. <laughs> so they'll like flow into a movie and then come back and then flow into a movie and then maybe come back and do two seasons. But certain shows are definitely going to be one and done. I think WandaVision's one and done. I think it should be. It I, should I think be, but you don't even have to have the same show. You can always just keep having limited series and the stories yeah. continue. And we may be in a post season uh, universe of, of streaming media. It could be that we don't obsess over seasons as much and we start seeing how stories just kind of fold over into other stories. Yeah, that would be great. I kind of feel like that that's what they're doing though, too, that it kind of um, pushes us to kind of look at the bigger picture too. Like how does, this tiny part move into something bigger. And then where do the characters go after that? And then do we come back to them or do we go back to go on to something else? Um, because like, I don't, I don't want to see WandaVision again. I want to see what's next. Like mm -hmm. I, I want to see where she goes from now, like where she goes next. I want to yeah. see that. I don't want to see anything else. Well, very cool. Well, we are coming up at two hours. Can you believe it? <laughs> and, and not one bit of toxic fandom poked its head into this discussion. It's a miracle. Wait, <laughs> wait, we can get that in. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you guys for being on. Um, let's tell everyone where they can find you. Brian, Nicole, Reels and Heels. Yeah, Reels and Heels uh, every Saturday at 2.15 Eastern. Um, I have uh, a couple of comic book guests uh, this weekend, which um, I'll announce tomorrow. <laughs> I, I've, I've, he will announce them to me tomorrow as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting uh, comic, um, and I'll have all the details. I just don't want to... To make the announcement just yet, because I have to work some some things out. But yeah, you can catch us every uh, Saturday on Reels and Heels and the HWS Web TV YouTube channel, where I fly by the seat of my pants and thank God I only have to be here to look pretty. And I do have to say, Willow did an awesome job last weekend. And uh, Willow, hold that thought. Thank you. Hold, hold, wait, because I'm we we got a big build up here. Um, Kelly, Phoenix Sisters cosplay on YouTube. Um, yep. Drunk comics, and then for us, you do uh, back issue Breakfast Club, and uh, what? So what's coming up on Drunk Comics? Uh, drunk Comics, actually, it's funny you guys were talking about Godzilla because that's the next episode. <laughs> 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 I'm editing that one. And it should be dropping tomorrow. All right, cool. So. Um, DL Memphis, you guys are finishing up a record with the Murdering Crows. What else is going on? Well, uh, that's my primary focus at the moment. Although you can find me Saturday mornings occasionally with uh, Back of the Cereal Box and just kind of let this horse or let this cat out of the bag. Um, we do have another show coming up that's part of the Back of the Cereal Box franchise called Ice Cream Queens, which is going to be horror, goth, and everything that's creepy that just appeals to my little dark heart. So you'll be seeing that. Um, you can find me in the Murdering Crows on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube, anywhere that you think something creepy might be looking, lurking in a corner. That's where you're gonna find me, the spider. Lucas, what uh, what rabble rousing are you up to? <laughs> oh boy, you know it's uh, <laughs> it's weird when you. Uh, when you can't figure out what to name a podcast and you can't even catch up to posting all of your videos on YouTube, but you can go over to YouTube and see some of my ever, ever uh, evolving backlog of my uh, sociopolitical banter uh, in day drinking discussions. 
Uh, but I am in the process of branding, naming, and conceptualizing that into something more. And I'm actually getting some guidance from our own John Pica on uh, how to put that together. Now, I, I don't know if it'll be under that banner, but I do have the stump. If you're uh, on Facebook, go look that up. It's impossible to keep up with everything. Um, and then I am also, like I mentioned at the top, studying up and getting my background material for a future drunk comics. And uh, that ought to be a lot of fun. <laughs> hey, Lucas, I, I have a, su a suggestion. You should have a show called Lucas Calls Out. Because after watching your Domino's video thing, uh, that was hilarious. <laughs> well, I did, I did get those. Uh, actually, here you go. Look at that. This is what happens when you tell Domino's that they're racist. <gasps> <laughs> was that coupons or was that complaints? That is uh, like 50 gift certificates for a one topping pizza. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> they now deliver to our neighborhood. Okay. <laughs> And of course, you can find Willow on Reels and Heels as a co-host in yeah. her own show, Willow's Pillow Talk on the Hanging with Web Show Network. But this Saturday, da -da 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 this Saturday on Back of the Cereal Box, Willow is taking over <laughs> as the host, along with DL Memphis and Kelly and our very own Aubrey X. To talk about confessions of a geek girl and uh, what it's like to be a woman in geek pop culture. Oh, it's going to be fun taking over your show, John. <laughs> I feel like you should apologize in advance. <laughs> Disclaimer. Hey, never uh, apologize. As long as you all have your big bowl of cereal, and I, okay. that's that's not a euphemism. That that's um as and, and as long as. As long as you keep it clean, drop all the innuendo you want, um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Can we get definitions for what you mean by clean? Define clean. <laughs> I, I think That's I already... So sad I have to work. I, I think I already uh, specified that in a message. Um, I think I might have missed that. Is that a problem? <laughs> what, what's what's funny is I actually searched on uh, Hot Topic today to see if they still sold the Elvira cereal, and unfortunately, I think I missed it. But <laughs> that'll be epic. But epic. I'll, I'll try to find something cool for Saturday. <laughs> Very cool. And and so uh, Willow, after we're done tonight, you have freedom to play in the uh, in the studio. So. Um, I've loaded up videos and commercials and you can add photos and all of that stuff. So uh, one last comment from our peanut gallery. Clyde Hall says, thank you for this discussion, everyone. Great analysis and takeaways. Sharing the end of WandaVision was lovely. We persevere. Love you, Clyde. <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, if you like the show, shows because we're on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram with exclusive content on each of those and exclusive content on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Um, so Willow and Kelly, uh, as of this Saturday, you guys will be iHeartRadio celebrities too. <laughs> iHeartRadio! <laughs> um so, uh, yeah, if you like the shows, tell two or 300 of your closest friends and family to come share the fun. And until the next time, love you, mean it. We'll catch you on the flip side. Good night. <laughs>